Good morning, everyone. Today we have a special guest. So luckily for you, once again, I'm not going to be the one talking so you don't have to suffer from my terrible French-Canadian accent. Uh, today we're lucky to have Ferno Ninja. Uh, it's the third time that we reschedule, but we finally have him. And I guess we're just cursed by the god. Uh, I'm having some power outage issues. So if you don't see this recording, it means that you saw someone else recording in parallel. Uh, that being said, uh, tonight we're going to talk about ETW and some Syscall uh, hunting. Uh, BRC4, which is uh, the rat that uh, Ninja Perno, uh right himself so i guess without further ado please introduce yourself and the screen is yours uh thanks charles so everyone i am uh yeah i'm basically known as paranoid ninja on twitter and elsewhere but my actual name is chetan nayak which i'm not sure whether a lot of people know about because uh, a lot of times i get emails for my workshop registrations and for brute retail and i keep uh, uh people keep calling me paranoid ninja so that is the reason so i am uh chetan nayak by the way and um, i'm also so just a quick background information about myself um i am basically from india and i am basically the director at a dark vortex where i provide several different types of uh workshops uh pretty advanced workshops or both on blue team and red team and i have also built uh the product the tool which i call as brute retail c4 so the name C4 is pretty funny. I'll come to that part later on as to why that name came into existence. Uh, but yeah, that's basically one of the products and uh, that I have built uh, since past two years. And um, it's, it's going pretty great for now. And I'll explain a bit about the evasion tactics and techniques and why I wrote that tool and why it's a bit different from the other existing uh, command and control centers in the market there is right now. And uh, it's a commercial tool. It's not open source. And I'll also give the reasons for open why is it op not open source right now uh, later on when we take a look at that. So uh, today we'll be uh, talking a bit about the position independent code and uh, that's basically in C. So it's funny that uh, how I found this technique was because I was actually planning to implement the um, object file execution technique of Cobalt Strike in Brute Retail around two years back. And I was just going through, I was doing some of my research and I was reading a lot of documentation on the compilers and uh, how the PE works. And that's how I came across this specific technique. And we'll also be taking a look at uh, ETWTI hooking, uh, syscalls, and how uh, the hooking actually works by a lot of different EDRs. And then we'll be taking a look at brute retail and how all of this can be combined together to work alongside brute retail, both on the evasion part as well as on the other parts of building your payload, executing them in memory, and um, working alongside that. So. I have three different uh, virtual machines over here. One is a uh, random host and the other two are in a domain, which I'll be using later on for a quick uh, overview and the demo of brute retail. And I'll be using this uh, VM that I have over here, which I'll be using specifically for uh, the uh, for reversing, not exactly reversing. We won't be doing a lot of reversing, but I will be switching back and forth between the C code that we have over here and the x64 debugger that we have so that it is easier to understand for people to see how it actually looks like when something is getting executed. So I'll get started with position independent code for now. And uh, yeah, so basically we'll be taking a look at uh, a very simple program to get started so that I know that some of the people over here might have a lot of experience. Uh, while... Ninja, I think you're not yeah. sharing your screen anymore. Uh, it's still freezing mm. on the, uh, the, the Discord. Uh, page and obviously you're not seeing the the oh. updated text so i think it froze okay uh surprisingly i can see you moving just the, the discord <laughs> that seems freeze that's weird oh, now, okay now okay back. Oh, yeah it just went back i guess don't do anything okay okay <laughs> uh i haven't uh can you guys still see my screen yes we can see the discord that's all and okay you can only see the discord you cannot see the visual code right correct uh, okay, let me just uh, unshare and reshare again, I think. Yeah, you may want to share the whole screen instead of the window. There's an option. I think uh, top left corner, you have window or screen. Ah, right. Like that. Yeah, got it. Okay, can you see you the go. visual yes. code? Yes. Okay, okay. My bad. Sorry, I, I shared the wrong screen. So, sorry. Okay, so yeah, I have two, uh, three different VMs over here. The first one is a random VM, which contains a lot of debug tools and everything. 
the uh, remaining two are basically in a small active directory environment which i'll be using for the brute retail demo later on and how a lot of things uh, change uh, when you move from something like cobalt strike or any other open source c2 to brute retail kind of thing so I'll, I'll be giving you a quick overview on that and how a lot of things are different from both of the both the other c2s that are currently there so yeah and i'll be switching back and forth between the c code that i have and the code that and uh, in debugger so that it's easier for people to understand because i know that uh, there will be a lot of people who are extremely capable over here whereas there might be a few people who are who might be getting just getting started in that case so for the same reasons i'll be ex uh, explaining everything from the very basic part to a bit advanced as we proceed so yeah to get started we will take a look at the position independent code that we have over here so before i get into the position independent code this is how a normal simple windows code would look like in c and i'm not a fan of visual studio and clang i know a lot of people are i myself use mingw my whole brute retail uh, is basically written in mingw and nasm itself i respect uh, that. For, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not i don't like compilers to optimize the code for me exactly. I, I like to know what exactly is happening in the back end so exactly. that's the same reason yeah yeah so uh, yeah uh, so basically over here we have a very simple program i have a few headers over here uh, the this is the main program that we have a simple car variable over here which is of length 260 kilobytes a uh, d word value that's a double word we have a windows api call that's called as get computer name a and if you just take a look it's basically exported from the header file windows.h which tells us that it takes up two arguments a pointer to a buffer and a pointer to a, a long pointer to a double word and your car is nothing but a, a lp a lpstr itself long pointer to string that's a null terminated string and another one a pointer to a double word that we have so when we execute something like this uh, and once we execute that we'll simply print whatever response that we get and a quick look into the get computer name a api call will simply tell you uh let me just open up chrome over here uh so i'll be switching back and forth between each of these and yeah it's still opening just bear with me i hate chrome i should probably open yeah i agree with that too <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't use Chrome apart from my Google Meet uh, calls. I, I am more of a fan of Mozilla, so that's the reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so a quick uh, look at the uh, API call uh, tells you that it's basically a function of Windows itself, which returns whether it's true or false, and it will also tell you. It basically takes an input parameter over here, as you can see, as a buffer value. That's an empty buffer, which should contain uh, at least this should be the maximum length. I have provided over here as 260, which is more or less the same. And then we have a long pointer to a double word over here. So once I execute this, uh, this uh, function is basically exported from kernel 32 DLL. And then we have another function that we are calling printf, which most of you might know that in Windows it basically comes from your msvcrt.dll. Now these things are pretty important when you're writing position independent code because whenever you want to execute a shell code or PIC or uh, something similar into memory, you want to make sure that there are no hard-coded addresses in memory because shellcode cannot work with hard-coded addresses. It needs to be exactly everything in the .txt section of the PE itself. So I'll tell you why this is important and why I'm going through this over here. I have a simple make file over here and as you can see that we have this compiler that I'm using the GCC cross compiler since I'm in Linux. And over here, you can see that I'm specifying um, the file over here, warnings all, M64, 464-bit compilation. I'm aligning all the sections and unwinding all the tables over here that I have. You can ignore this part for now because this is a bit of an ad on the advanced compiler flag kind of thing. I'm optimizing it and I'm, and I'm stripping any kind of debug symbols that we have. And I'm creating a simple get hostname.exe file. So I'll just uh, type make get hostname. And it should be compiled for us. So I'll go back to my Windows system that I have. If I quickly execute this, uh, let me know if the uh, font size is pretty low. Just All give good. me a sec. All good. Okay. Cool. So if I execute this, you can see that we have uh, desktop. That's basically the name of this host itself, which is something similar to your host name itself over here, as you can see. And I'll quickly open this in my debugger as well. So if I go to my shared drives, over here and to PIC and if I select this just to show you how this would work let me just uh, 
scroll it down over here so right now we have hit the entry point i have disabled the tls and other breakpoints that usually gets uh, hit in the start if i go to the symbols section if i go to kernel 32.dll and if i search for let's say get host name oh sorry i think get host name is basically in advapi32 my bad uh, let me check yeah it's in advapi32 i think uh one sec let me check it is yeah sometimes uh the uh calls yeah it's basically in kernel 32 itself so let me just search for it get host name and let me probably check yeah it's probably searching it from over here itself yeah so uh it's basically from kernel base.dll but a lot of times you're uh, whenever you call kernel 32 right if i just open up cff explorer i should get that it's also there in kernel 32 or dll except in the current reason i'm getting kernel based or dll because uh, there's a high reason that the dll that i am using right now which i am statically linking over here in my case in that case it's basically residing kernel based or dll but windows has also uh, added that uh, your uh, get host name uh, sorry, get hostname API call inside the kernel 32 and kernel base.dll itself. But the point over being that it's basically getting called. So if I just go over here just to validate, I'll just add a breakpoint over here. And the funny part is that I'm actually calling um, get, sorry, it's get computer name, eh? not get hostname, eh? my bad. Sorry. Uh, that happens sometimes with me. Yeah, it's over here as you can see. Get hostname is a uh, totally different API call, my bad. I just got a bit confused and then I'll also search. So I have added a breakpoint over here as you can see and I'll type printf and I'll go to msvcrt because that's where the printf will get called from. So I'll just scroll down. I'll search for printf over here you can see and I'll just add a breakpoint here. So if I click on the play button over here you can see that we have hit on the breakpoint that's get computer name A. If we take a look at the registers over here quickly let me just uh, change the font over here because uh, for some reason I cannot scroll and zoom it out. Let me just increase everything to 14 itself. Oh, it's pretty readable to be honest. Uh, oh, even the small ones? Ah, okay, my bad. But I mean, it's, it's acceptable and I'm blind. Okay, <laughs> cool, uh, no problem. So I'll just drag this over here. And you can see over here that we have a few registers, right? So normally whenever you're calling any kind of uh, uh, x64 uh, uh, function calls, right? Uh, it's, it basically happens in this manner. The first argument goes into the RCX register. The second argument goes into the RDX. The third and fourth argument basically go into the R8 and R9 registers and the remaining arguments simply go on stack. So just to validate this, if we go back here, you can take a look over here that our first value is going to be get host name over here itself. The second is going to be a pointer to uh, D word length. So which basically means that our first argument that we have should go into the RCX register and the second argument will go into the RDX register. Now this is only valid for your um, x64 naming conventions. It will be different for your x86 in that case. So if I go back, you can see that we have RCX and RDX. If I just right click and follow it in dump, and you can see that we have some garbage values over here. And the reason for that is because in our uh, RCX, we have just initialized the variable. We have not initialized it with any null bytes or something like that. We have just created that variable only. Whereas it's different in case of host length. So if I select the right one, and if I click on follow in dump, you can see the value over here is 0104. Uh, That's basically 104 in a hex, which will simply be your 260 in uh, decimal itself. So that's how we can identify our variables that our variables that we have passed on to our function calls. Now, one of the things that I would like to highlight over here is I'll simply go over here and let's say I'll uh, I'll just type object dump hyphen m intel because I like to re read Intel assembly, not the ATAT ones, and I'll type get hostname dot exe. Uh, sorry, my bad. I'll just type hyphen d to dump everything, and you can see over here. If I scroll to the very top, sorry, from that should be from over here. Yeah, you can see that we have the disassembly of the whole text section. The text section is a section which is always a readable section in itself. 
And if I scroll down, this is the whole executable code that we have, which is what we exactly need. So, and these are the op codes for each of the executable instruction. So, if you are able to execute, if you are able to extract this op code using uh, some batch script or something like that, and if you are able to execute that in memory, we will be able to execute our code. But the problem over here is that is that a lot of the code that we have over here in the text section will indirectly call your uh, other sections that you have. So let me go back to the very bottom to show you how this would look like. You can see that we have a few other CRT sections. We have a dot TLS section, which is our thread local storage. This is our CRT function, which will do the task of printing and everything. And if I just do, uh, let's say hyphen H over here instead of hyphen D. Sorry, it's a lowercase H. My bad. Yeah, you can see all the different sections that are currently available into our get host name. .exe. And this is where the problem lies because if you try to execute just the dot text section of your executable and if you try to execute that, you won't be able to execute. It will simply crash because a lot of the variables over here or I would say instructions indirectly reflect the variables or instructions into our other code. For example, all the um, uh, initialized sections will simply go into the dot data section. The read only variables will go into the dot R data section. The uninitialized variable simply goes into the dot BSS section. The import sections goes into the I data and a lot of other things. We cannot have all of these different types of sections that you see over here into our code if you want to execute them. Because if you just extract the dot text section and if we execute them, it will try to uh, execute or extract or and we'll try to access some of the variables or data in the other portions of the section and will simply lead to a crash. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that whenever we compile our code, we only have a single section, which is our dot text section that you see over here. So what we're going to do over here in this case is I'll go back to our code and I will make a few changes. But before I make any few changes, one of the most important things is that if I go back, if I restart our exe our executable, let me clear the screen and restart it again. And you can see over here that by default, these few DLLs are always loaded. Now we know that kernel uh, your get computer name A resides within kernel 32, but we did not call any API call within kernel based or anti DLL. Same thing goes for MSVCRT. We only called uh, printf from MSVCRT.dll itself. However, there are other DLLs that will always be loaded by Microsoft. These DLLs are called as known DLLs by Microsoft itself. So what we would need to do is that if we want to find out the uh, get computer name API call, we would need to first find out the address for kernel 32.dll and or we can directly go ahead and call it from ntdll.dll itself by using the syscall. For the time being, we'll take a look at the kernel32.dll itself. So we will first need to find out the kernel32.dll inside the process environment block of Windows, which if you can simply open up WinDBG, for example. So to give you a quick overview of as to how this would look like, if I open WinDBG, let me open up any simple executable over here. Let me go to this PC, C, Windows, System32, and cmd.exe. So if you go over here, you can take a look at all the DLLs that have been loaded for cmd.exe. Oh, uh, okay, this should be good. And now let's say if I want to take a look at the process environment block, I can just type simply dt, that's display, nt exclamation underscore peb. And it will return me all the uh, information about process environment block that I have over here. Now, if you scroll down in the process environment block, you would see the LDR, the, which is basically the loader of Windows. And LDR is at the offset 18, that's 0x80. The PB will always be at the offset of 0x60 from the general segment or the GS register for x64. In case of x86, it will be into the offset of 0x30. It is a well-defined or a well-known um, offset that is already documented on the Microsoft's website. So what we are currently uh, uh, interested in, is, in right now is basically to find out what exactly or where exactly is the address of kernel 32.dll in memory. So if we go to the general segment register, if we get the 0x60 offset, we'll get the PEB. From the PEB's uh, address that we get in memory, if we add the offset of 0x18, we will get the LDR, that's our uh, loader, and it is of the structure that is PB LDR data. So if I just type something like, for example, let's say dt space nt exclamation underscore pbldr data, 
this is what we get the whole structure of your PBLDR data in this case. Now over here, these three, um, I'd say uh, structures that you see over here, which are nothing but list entries, which are your uh, doubly linked list in this case. So each of these entries contain their own entries itself as a nested structure. So if I take the first, uh, let's say, let's say, for example, if I take in memory order module list, right? So the first structure over here will contain the information about the uh, file that was loaded into memory itself, which in our case will be cmd.exe. The second structure will be the secondary DLL that was loaded. The third structure will be the third DLL that was loaded. So if you are able to calculate the size of the in-memory order module list, and if we add it to the initial structure itself, we should get the address for our second structure. That will be the address for that will be the structure for our second DLL. Similarly, it would go on for the third DLL, fourth DLL, and so on. So in that way, uh, Microsoft doesn't have to manually add or allocate as much memory for a selected number of DLLs. We can have as many DLLs loaded into a process as you want. That's what basically the idea of Microsoft was behind implementing this specific structure. Now, just to uh, take a look at how it looks like in memory, if I go to the very top and if I, sorry, if I just scroll down to the very bottom and if I type, let's say, for, let me clear the screen. And if I type, let's say DT, uh, if I just type exclamation PEB, you would see the whole process environment blocks information. And you can see that the LDR or the loader is at this specific offset. Similarly, if I type DT NT exclamation PEB, and if I type, let's say this specific address that I have, uh, sorry, DT NT exclamation underscore PEB, I think, yeah, sorry, my bad, it was underscore PEB. You would see that I have, we have basically typecasted this loader's address that we have to this specific value over here. Sorry, my bad. Uh, what I've done over here is wrong. My bad. This is basically the address of the loader, which is basically your LDR, which means it is the address for your LDR data, uh, LDR, PEB LDR data, not underscore PEB. So if I type underscore PEB underscore LDR underscore data, which is the exact structure that we saw earlier, you would see that it has uh, given us the exact addresses of each of the nested entries that we have over here. And similarly, let's say, for example, if we take a look uh, we know that if you just google up this specific entry that we have microsoft will tell you that even though it tells you that it's a list entry that you see over here the actual value or the actual type of this specific structure is going to be your in um, yeah let me just go over here and you can see that your in memory order module list is basically of the data type ldr data table entry so if I go back and if I just type, let's say, for example, uh, underscore LDR, underscore data, underscore table, underscore entry, let me just paste that over here. And instead of this, if I type out this address that we see over here, which basically means we are simply typecasting this address that we have to the LDR data table entry structure, we should be able to see the first loaded module, which in our case is going to be cmd.exe. Similarly, if I just copy out, let's say the next value over here, and if I paste this, for example, we should be able to see the second value that we have in our case, uh, which is going to be ntdll.dll. If I copy the third value that we have over here for the in order module list, we should, be, we should see that the third value is going to be kernel32.dll in our case, which basically means that the first uh, image that gets loaded into memory is going to be your NT, uh, your uh, actual process itself, the second DLL will be NTDLL, the third one will be kernel32 and so on. Just one thing to make note of over here is that whenever you're dealing with any kind of EDRs in this case, there's a high chance that they will load their own DLL before these DLLs. So you might have to tweak the code that I'm going to show you right now in order to evade EDR. For example, if you're dealing with something like Sentinel-1, Sophos, or maybe 40 EDR, or even I'd say McAfee, we, I know that these DLLs specifically are, uh, these EDRs specifically load their own DLLs before that. However, there are other, uh, that's in user land itself. So our aim is to currently, so we'll be uh, ignoring EDRs for the time being. We'll take a look at that later on. Uh, our aim currently is to find out the address for kernel 32. So uh, if you go to the code, so all of this code that I'm showing you right now is totally available on my GitHub repository. It, it's been there since past two years since I wrote a blog on this. So if you go to this code that we have over here, which is gethost.c, and if you take a look at uh, another uh, header file, that's address hunter.h. So let me just, 
zoom out a bit we can see we have a function called as get kernel 32 which reads the offset 0x60 that is our pb address uh, from our general segment register into kernel into this variable that we have that's a long pointer uh, uh, we are typecasting that to our pp eb that's our pointer to our process environment block structure the one that we had created over here if you take a look all of this structure was directly extracted from your uh, WinDBG itself. So if you, you can just type DT NT exclamation underscore PEB and you would get the whole structure over here of PEB uh, directly in WinDBG itself. So I'm extracting the uh, loader's address as you can see. Then I'm going to the in memory order module list. I'm, uh, and we are uh, the actual value over here that's base DLL name that is of the type Unicode string. So we are extracting the buffer that's basically going to be the actual. Uh, name of the DLL itself, the length of the DLL. We are creating a raw 13 hash and we are trying to find whether that raw 13 hash matches this uh, hash that we have over here. This is basically nothing but your kernel 32 DLL in Unicode string uh, and all of the values of kernel 32 DLL is rotated right. That stands for raw 13. So it's rotated right 13 times in short. So that's what we have over here and Yes, let me go back to the code over here and simply we are basically so what we're going to do is we are going to walk the PEB we're going to walk the LDR data and table entry we're going to extract the base DLL name in the base DLL name we are going to extract the name of the DLL we are going to convert it to a custom raw 13 hash that we have you can use any of your custom algorithms if you require I use a different one however the raw 13 is a very famous one that's been used since probably past 20 years or so so uh, the, I, I think it's probably introduced in 1999, the raw13 uh, algorithm itself. So over here, yeah, we are basically simply rawing raw13. We are performing the raw13 algorithm on the name. We are trying to match if it is the same. If it is, it means that we have found out the DLL base, which is going to be the base address of our DLL, and we will simply return the DLL address itself. Now the reason why uh, we are trying to find the DLL address is because once we find the DLL address. We will walk the PE and then we will try to find out where exactly is the address for our uh, function itself. So normally you, what uh, a lot of people do is basically they try to find out the address for get proc address. Then using the get proc address they will try to find out the functions for everything else for the function pointers itself. I however don't like to do that instead of that I like to write my own get proc address in itself which is what you would see over here in my case. So if I go to the second code. You would see that I have um, assigned two variables for msvcrt.dll because we also need to perform the printf function and the kernel 30.dll and a few other variables over here which is of unsigned integer 64-bit variables over here because I'll be compiling them into 64-bit. I'm extracting the address for kernel 32. After that, I'm creating another variable which contains the string load library A. But now some of you might be wondering that why is it exactly in this specific format instead of typing something like for example like this now the reason for that is because if I use something like load library a like this it means that it is an initialized variable and if I type it something in something like for example uh, let me just go here if I type something like for example let's say uh, test equals to load library a then it becomes a read only variable which means it will go into the dot r data section which is not something that we can have if instead of this if I do something like this this will go into the dot data uh, section which is again not something that we can afford in our shell code that we are going to execute which means that we have to add it as a byte code so if I go and create something like this then the compiler will think that we are adding byte code to a simple uh, car variable and it will directly add this into the dot text section just remember that this is limited to a maximum length of 255 if you try to add 256 or 257 different characters to a string over here then you won't be able to do and it will directly be pushed to the dot r data section until unless you play with the compiler and ask it to force the whole code into the dot text section itself so once we have that we'll simply go to the get symbol address and we'll try to find out the address for load library a so we'll use the function called as get simple address uh, the get symbol address will simply take the function the address of our kernel 32 and the string and if I go to this specific function you can take a look at over here so over here what it is going to do is it's going to take the exact base address of our handle to the module and then it will simply typecast the base address of our uh, DLL or the handle both of them are the same of the DLL and it will typecast them to the specific structures of Microsoft that we have 
it will first type cast it to the ma20 headers so in short to give you a brief information as to what we are going to do is if this is now cff explorer that i have if i go to c windows let's say system 32 kernel 32 dll you can see that each dll has a different set of pe and uh, p uh, addresses and i'd say file offsets uh, the relative virtual addresses and a lot of different things so we are going to walk you can see that the offset starts at 0 because uh, uh, it's basically where the p itself starts the initial value over here is mz header that's uh, your 4d5a after that uh, which is of 2 bytes because you can see over here that the next value is set again 2 bytes then we have another uh, cblp which is another value which is of again 2 bytes then 2 bytes and so on and there are each of these values that you over here that you can see is of different bytes and these are as you can see of the data type word finally we reach the uh, address of our nt header which is at the address 0x3 which is at the address uh, e8 as you can see over here which is of double word as you can see 1 2 3 and 4 that's four bytes which is basically eight bits in nature and if i go to the e8 uh, variable over here you can see that at the e8 offset we have our nt header now similarly you can keep on parsing these headers and finally you will eventually be able to reach the export directory and inside export directory once you find out the executable section you would be able to find out these different function pointers that we have over here now all of these since we know the size of the headers over here and they are going to stay the exact same according to the microsoft documentation microsoft has clearly documented each of these portions so if you just select search for let's say pe format microsoft has a really good documentation on this that's where i myself learned from and they have specified how what is the size and length of each of these data types whether they are word d word or string or unicode string or something else as well so that's what we are going to do we are going to type cast this uh, base address of our kernel 32 in memory to the uh, image nt headers p headers and everything once we are able to type cast them we'll walk through each of them find the export directory rva once we have that we will find out where exactly it resides in which specific section uh, in our case it will basically reside into the dot uh, text section itself once we find that we will try to find out what exactly is the address pointer over here our aim is to find out the get uh, computer name a which is if i scroll down you should see it somewhere over here itself um, get computer name a yeah over here as you can see this is what we are going to find out and once we are able to find out the actual function pointers rva if we add this value that you see over here which is we are going to find out programmatically the offset of get computer name a if we add this value to the base address of our kernel 32 dll which is what we have over here we should get the base address of get computer name a and if we execute that that would be the actual value which is what we also executed over here in this case So simply uh, that's what we are going to do our get symbol address as you can see over here alpha new which is going to be our nt header we are going to find out the export directory address address function of names and then we are simply looping it over here and whatever function name that i had specified over here earlier that's uh, going to be load library a in our case as you can see we are simply finding the function pointer for load library a as you can see if we have the string comparison then we'll simply go and extract the export address table add the uh, export address table file offset to our actual dll address and simply return the value over here after breaking it and once we have that we should have the address of load library a after that we'll try to find out uh, we'll basically try to find out the address for get computer name a as well similarly uh, we will simply try to load msvcrt.dll using the load library a function uh, and in order to execute this as a function pointer we will need to type cast this to something that tells us that it's a pointer to a function so we will just copy paste the exact function code from microsoft documentation and we'll specify that it's basically a pointer as you can see the star over here to a type defined function over here in our case the parenthesis over here specify that it's a function it's a pointer to a specific function of the type load library a which returns a value handle to a module and the argument that it takes is a long pointer to a constant string which is your lpc str or your car pointer which in our case is going to be the value of msvcrt.dll so we load msvcrt.dll over here we try to find out the printf pointer from the msvcrt.dll like earlier once we have that the remaining portion is the same as get host name over here we are simply executing the function pointer that we have over here as you can see by type casting it to get computer name a and similarly over here we are specifying the host name and host name length 
and we will execute that and we'll simply print that after that as well quickly going to the make file you would be able to see that i have a few different things over here and one more thing which is different is that we don't have any int main we only have a void over here instead of having int main now the reason for that is because whenever you use int main right your compiler either gcc or your clang compiler both of them will try to statically link your kernel 32 as well as your msvcrt.dll because just think about it for a second that whenever you execute a payload let's say for example whenever you execute let's say this small code that we have over here we are simply writing our uh, function code right but if we type something like for example int argc and car pointer argv something like this then even this get, gets parsed in our case. So the question is who exactly parses the argument counters and the argument vectors over here. In our case it is going to be msvcrt.dll itself. But however if it is going if uh, which basically means that if msvcrt.dll is going to be the entry point for our uh, pill our file it means that the whole code of msvcrt.dll will be statically linked to our exe which is what we don't want because the moment we have a static linking msvcrt.dll will add its own uh, information to dot data dot r data and other sections which is what we cannot have so we want to avoid that altogether since we are also loading msvcrt.dll uh, dynamically over here so we are going to write a simple assembly code uh, over here we're going to specify that there's an external function called as get host let me just open it side by side so that it's easier to understand which is what we have over here then then we are specifying that we have another function called as align host and you can see that i specified the segment dot text and the align stack uh, function over here the label to our function so which basically means that this function will basically push our rdi register to stack because we are going to override that register we are moving our stack pointer the currently that we have because we don't know where we would be whenever shell code gets executed right so we need to exe we need to save whatever um, registers that we are going to use to stack before executing them so we are moving the stack pointer to rdi we are adding uh, we are ex uh, saving some space for any uh, arguments or anything else on stack by first subtracting the st uh, 16 bytes to make sure that the stack is aligned properly with the 16 byte size format and the second thing is we are going to allocate some space for our any uh, additional functions or additional variables that gets passed along. We are simply calling the get host function which is going to be this. And we are, then we are restoring the exact same thing that's moving RDI to RSP which is the opposite of this. We are popping our uh, stack pointer back to RDI and then we are simply returning as to uh, coming back to exactly where we started. Now once we create this assembly code. We also need to tell the compiler, which is going to be GCC in our case, that you need to make sure that the align stack is going to be the entry point, and then this get host function code will come after align stack and not before that. Else, uh, we will not be able to compile the code. So, in our make file, you can see that we are simply uh, using NASM over here. We are compiling it to a 64 bit format, and we are uh, saying that edges stack.asm file, that is what we have over here. We are going to convert that to object file. We are converting our get host.c file that we have over here also to an object file. Hyphen C specifies it to be an object file itself. Once we have both the object files, we will be linking both of them. But this one different thing is that we have a file, we have another option that stands for hyphen T, which means use a linker script, and we have a linker.ld file. If I open this linker.ld file, it says that the entry point is going to be align stack. And the remaining sections which go into the dot text section will be align stack and yeah let me just modify this to get host over here and the get host value over here itself so right now what it means is that it will try to add these two portions directly to stack directly to not to stack the to the dot text section and our entry point is going to be align stack in our case which is going to be this specific portion so now if i just type if i go here and if i type let's say make get host if I have not done any mistake, as you can see, there are no errors over here. So before I uh, do or execute anything, let me just uh, to, um, type it out over here, get host.exe. And you can see that we have only two different sections. Now some of you might be wondering that we have another iData section, which is what we don't want. So just to show you how this would look like, let me just dump everything. And you can see that we don't have any code in our iData section. 
which means it's literally zero. The only section that we have over here right now is the dot text section, which is nothing but our executable code in this case. So what we can do is we can simply go and extract these uh, this portion of code that we have, the op code that we have over here. And let me see whether I have written it down somewhere. Uh, if not, it's probably a pretty, yeah. Over here, let me just open this one. We have this uh, code, which I got from one of the stack overflow code, which simply performs object dump and extracts the actual code, actual op code that we have that is going to use, uh, that is this specific portion using awk and all the other portions. So if I just type this, you can see that we have the whole shell code over here. We don't need the whole shell code. The only thing that we need is still FFF over here. So I'll just copy this portion of code that we have over here. And I'll simply, uh, I have another file, which you can see over here. That's called as exec. I'll paste my shell code over here. I can simply just copy it till the knob bytes itself. I don't even need slash FFF over here. You can simply copy it till the knob bytes itself, the, till the ret value itself. That is going to be zero uh, slash x c3, which is uh, ret uh, for op code. Uh, but I'm just copying the knob bytes just in case. And uh, over here, we are do simply doing this. Let me check the size. It's 721 bytes. Let me change the size that we have over here. And finally, uh, yes. So over here, it's pretty simple. Uh, we are doing a very simple process injection. We're allocating uh, space for our shell code that's of 721 bytes, as you can see. We are reserving and committing it as read-write. Uh, we'll print the address on our screen. We'll type memcpy, copy our shell code over there, send the permissions to page execute, and finally, uh, we'll uh, yeah, you can ignore this uh, portion that I've written. It's for it was for something else, and I'll just type this exclamation mark. Okay, and finally, we'll simply uh, type uh, get char over here. Uh, which will simply before executing our code, we'll just try to see whether how it looks like where in uh, process hacker itself, just to validate as to how it looks like. So I'll just type x86 gcc exec.c hyphen o documents uh, exec. Yeah, I'll just save it over here itself. And finally, we have the exe.exe .exe compile. Let me change the name exec.exe. I will go back to our code. Let me first execute this and see whether it works properly. And yep, as you can see, we are getting the output over here. That's our host name, which means our code was executed successfully. I'll hit this. I'll open process hacker to see how it looks like. Let me search exec.exe. If I go here, you can see a single, you should be able to see a single X region, as you can see, because we changed our permission from page uh, read write to page execute, which stands for X. It's not RX. And you can see the code over here. And you can see our actual code 57, 48, 89, which is exactly what you can see over here 57, 48, 89. And now you can execute or write any specific shell code that you want in this manner. And you would be able to execute them. So this is basically how you can write your own position independent code without having to worry about uh, any other sections because I know a lot of people are basically scared to write assembly because you have to manage the stack you have to manage the registers and a lot of other things which is not exactly something that you have to worry about when uh, writing your position independent code in C so yeah that was specifically for the position independent code so any doubts I, I haven't taken a look at the discord channel any doubts any queries are welcome before I proceed ahead I guess someone asked why you didn't use get module endo instead of your get symbol function because you could technically get an endo on your own module, right? Yes, good question. But the funny thing is that the get module handle itself is a part of kernel 32 or DLL, which means if you try to directly use get module handle, get module handle, as you can see, it itself is a function within kernel 32. So without knowing the address of kernel 32, you cannot call get module handle. If you try to call it, then kernel 32 or DLL will be statically linked to your exe itself, which means uh, your uh, code again becomes static in nature and you will have the R data dot data and all those other sections. Our aim is to make sure that everything is dynamic. So we don't have any hard coded addresses or offsets in our um, uh, executable in our shell code. Does it answer the question? It does for me at least. But yeah, it totally mm -hmm. makes sense that you're not using something that is actually part of what you're trying to resolve, right? 
Yeah, and one of the other things that I always try to do, especially even with Brute Retail, when I write my code, right? I like to uh, minimize the use of any existing functions or libraries as much as possible. I don't use get proc address. I don't use get module handle. I don't use most of the functions like even load libraries sometimes to load the DLLs. All of these are written specifically from scratch so that any hooks that are already implemented on this function pointers can also be avoided in that case. So that's one of the reasons why I try to avoid a lot of these things. And that's basically the secondary yeah. reason. But it's, it would be impossible to write a shell code with get module handed in but this Yeah, it case. totally makes sense. As you pointed out, writing your own function, at least you have full control over it. And as you pointed out, like load library, for example, could be a hook uh, because under the hood, it's calling LDR, load DL or something like that, yep. which tend to be yep. hook. Uh, I remember I presented some stuff about come object and by default, there's a lot of ETW happening in yeah. the uh, code right, right. instance and all that stuff. So. <laughs> yes, because whenever you uh, call load library, A, it will indirectly call LDR load DLL which will in turn use the NT map view of section to map a file. And whenever yep. you call NT map view of section to uh, map a file from disk to memory, it will eventually execute uh, a loading of, uh, I'd say, uh, your DLLs into memory itself. And it will send a notification to your kernel, which will in turn be used by your uh, image uh, loading callback routines in the kernel mode to who can find out which DLLs are getting loaded. So yep. one way to avoid this is to write everything from scratch. Exactly. But you also have, you also end up having Rx sections or X sections in your variable, uh, which are not backed by any DLL in that case, which would not be the say, uh, scenario if you loaded directly it from uh, the disk using load libraries. So that's basically a downside of using that. So yeah, any questions, any doubts on this before we go ahead? So far, so good. Okay, uh, just give me around two minutes. I'll be back. I have someone at my door who's been pinging since past two minutes. So sure. I'll just be back in a sec. Okay. I'm glad to learn that I thought I was speaking fast, but I figured that you're speaking much faster than me, which is good. Yeah. And it's also nice because we kind of cover all that stuff uh, in various episodes, but it's always nice to have, you know, kind of a recap episode. So hopefully you guys are learning a thing or two in the meantime. Uh, I guess uh, he's also using structures of uh, of, uh, of the PAP yep. instead of using offsets. Yep. Well, it's more portable, like that's that's for sure. Uh, because keep in mind that uh, some of these offset may change over time. So using the structure, always make sure that when you compile your code, it's going to be safe, right? In the sense that uh, you're always going to have the proper offset. Exactly. Hopefully it's not the police that knock at his door or something like that. Imagine the guy is like live getting arrested. <laughs> that will be a first though. 